In this module, we will explore the usage of the Doppler effect in using pulse radar systems to determine radial velocity of targets, such as hydrometeors. Specifically, we will discuss the pulse Doppler system. In previous modules, we saw how pulse radar systems transmit packets of wave energy periodically, but a radar spends most of its time listening for a return signal. A Doppler radar is not only capable of measuring the intensity of backscattered power, but also the phase and frequency of the return signal. The range, as defined before, is the distance between the antenna and a target. However, hydrometeors within a volume are usually moving. The movement causes a slight phase shift of the signal, which may be used to determine the component of the velocity of targets parallel to the ray. Frequency shifts also occur However, they are usually too small to determine radial velocity, given the pulse length of about one microsecond typically used. The goal of Doppler radar for weather is to measure the radial velocity. The radial velocity is the mean speed of a volume of targets either toward or away from the radar. Typically, signage is defined such as a negative radial velocity represents targets moving toward the radar. Suppose the blue circle represents a volume of raindrops and that it is moving toward the radar. And suppose that the raindrops move a distance d between successive pulses separated in time, the pulse period of, say, about a millisecond. The radial velocity is then simply that distance divided by the pulse period. Of course, we cannot explicitly measure this distance with radar, However, we can detect a phase shift between successive pulses and use this to derive the frequency shift and radial velocity given the wavelength of transmitted radiation. The phase shift is characterized by the fraction of the distance traveled by radiation relative to its wavelength. Consider that transmitted radiation must travel to and from the target thus the two appears in the numerator in this equation. Simple algebra then yields an equation for radial velocity that is a function of the phase shift given some pulse period that's fixed and the wavelength of radiation transmitted. A rudimentary visualization of the phase shift between successive pulses is offered here. In this example, the orange and blue lines represent different pulses of returned or backscattered radiation that's emitted or transmitted by the radar antenna reflects off of hydrometeors in the contributing volume and return back to the radar antenna. We will assume that the phase of the transmitted radiation leaving the radar is the same for each pulse, but that targets in the contributing volume over here will cause some shift in the phase for the radiation once it returns to the antenna. If hydrometeors are moving, that phase will change between successive pulses. That's the phase shift that we're after. And it is the phase shift that we'll insert into the equation on the previous slide to derive the radial velocity. If the hydrometeors are moving neither toward nor away from the radar at all, then the phase shift will not differ between successive pulses. However, as we will soon see, Hydrometeors with just the right magnitude of non-zero velocity components toward or away from the radar can cause the same phase shift between successive pulses, creating an ambiguity in determining the Doppler velocity. One way of visualizing this problem is by plotting the phase shift over a sequence of pulses. This plot shows the sign of the phase of return signal of the radar for a series of pulses, shown on the x-axis. Effectively, given a known pulse period, Measuring a sequence of phase shifts allows us to recover the Doppler frequency. In this, fig in this figure, the blue dots represent an individual phase shift measurement between each pair of successive pulses. Next, let's zoom in on just a few pulses, where again the blue dots represent individual phase shift measurements. The red curve is one sinusoid that connects the blue dots. However, the green curve is a sinusoid with a different frequency that also satisfies the above phase shifts. These different Doppler frequencies correspond with different Doppler velocities. In fact, infinitely many sinusoids, all with a different frequency, 
can satisfy the observed phase shifts. The maximum unambiguous radial velocity that can be measured using this technique is called the Nyquist velocity. The Nyquist velocity corresponds with a phase shift of pi. This is because a phase shift of negative pi yields the same wave phase at the radar as a phase shift of plus pi, and so the radar would not be able to distinguish between the two. The Nyquist velocity, shown here, is a function of the PRF used by the radar. So as we increase the frequency of pulse transmission, or decrease the pulse period, the maximum resolvable velocity increases. The Nyquist velocity is also a function of wavelength, such that low frequency radar like S-band weather radar tends to have a higher Nyquist velocity than C-band and X-band precipitation radars. If a radar operator needed to resolve high velocities unambiguously, they could increase the PRF. However, the trade-off is that the unambiguous range, seen in a previous module, decreases. This trade-off between maximum resolvable unambiguous range and velocity is known as the Doppler dilemma. The ambiguity in Doppler velocity is illustrated here on a number line. Suppose, just for example, that the Nyquist velocity of a radar is 18 meters per second. If so, then a phase shift of plus or minus pi yields a Doppler velocity reported of plus or minus 18 meters per second. Furthermore, a phase shift of plus or minus 2 pi, which would correspond to a real radial velocity of plus or minus 36 meters per second, looks no different to a radar than a phase shift of 0. Therefore, the radial velocity reported of the plus or minus 2 pi phase shift would be zero, even though the actual velocity is much stronger. This problem is called velocity folding. We would say that the 36 meter per second observation is folded back into the plus or minus 18 meter per second Nyquist interval. One challenge of working with Doppler radar is unfolding the radial velocities, especially in cases where strong winds occur. Often, real-time data will not be automatically unfolded. One example from a ship-based C-band radar looking at strong winds in a mesoscale convective system over ocean is shown here. With radar reflectivity factor shown on the left and reported radial velocity illustrated on the right. The precipitation to the northeast of the ship consists of a leading line of convection with a large trailing stratiform region that extends off the image to the northeast because it is located beyond the maximum unambiguous range set by the PRF used. Although you cannot tell from a single image, a loop of imagery in real time indicated that the rain was moving toward the ship. The ship is located at the center. Within this precipitation, looking at the Doppler velocities now, a jet of descending inflow was present. The flow was stronger than, in this case, the 16.5 meter per second Nyquist velocity, which was the Nyquist velocity for this radar when using the PRF used at this time. We can quickly tell that the velocity is folded, given some background about the volume observed. In this case, there would be no reason to expect such strong horizontal shear to be present, like at this boundary right here, in the squall line as if the red in the right hand plot were actually representative of strong wind away from the radar right next to these relatively strong winds toward the radar. Physically, it's more sensible to interpret this radial velocity here as being representative of strong folded inbound velocities, such that these velocities are actually stronger or larger than 16.5 meters per second toward the radar, and that the strongest radial velocity is actually close to 30 meters per second toward the radar, down in these colors here. Another common example of velocity folding occurs in tornadoes. In strong tornadoes, folding can even occur with S-band radar. Again, reflectivity and radial velocity are respectively at left and right. This example is from May 3rd, 1999, the day a powerful tornado struck Moore, Oklahoma. In our radar lab for this course, we'll look at radar data from an EF-5 tornado that also occurred in Moore and followed a similar track on May 20th, 2013. The cells in this image were moving generally eastward. 
Therefore, the radial velocities at bottom left in this image are folded. The radar indicates outbound or positive radial velocities where the flow is actually strongly toward the radar and should be reporting a negative radial velocity. The fold occurs right along here where the velocity reaches the Nyquist velocity. In this figure, the purple colors, which indicate strong inbound motion, are located directly next to the reds, which indicate strong outbound motion. In the upper left quadrant, and focusing your eyes here onto the white circle in the region around it, folding due to strong rotation occurs. Large positive radial velocities right here are reported in an area of generally negative radial velocity. If we unfold the velocities in the white circle, we would see that the radial velocity is actually strongly negative, which implies in this particular case the presence of cyclonic vorticity, as denoted by the white arrows that proportionally, based on their lengths, represent the true radial velocities in these general locations. In a contributing volume, millions of individual hydrometeors may be present. Not all of them move at the same speed. The Doppler radial velocity reported represents the mean radial velocity of targets in a contributing volume. Some radars can capture the Doppler spectrum in a volume and report a quantity called the spectral width. The spectral width describes the width of a distribution of radial velocities in a volume. For the panel on the right, suppose that the signal above the background noise level is received within a range of phase shifts. The yellow bell curve represents that range detected with the peak power coming from the radial velocity here that corresponds with some phase shift. The spectral width of this curve is similar to twice the standard deviation of Gaussian. A couple of examples from real data are shown at left. The top example shows the distribution of radial velocities for a volume of ice crystals that were moving toward the radar and an average of 1.5 meters per second. However, ice crystals with velocities of zero and over, up to over three meters per second toward the radar were observed. Each tick mark right here is about one meter per second, and you can sort of figure out where they are based on this line here, which is one and a half meters per second. And at the bottom is a Doppler spectrum for falling raindrops viewed by a vertically pointing radar. The mean of the spectrum was at about 6 meters per second, but the raindrops falling at between 0 and about 9 meters per second were observed. In these two examples, the spectral width is much smaller for these ice crystals than it is for the raindrops. And this would tell you that the mean radial velocity in this particular example at the top with a smaller spectral width is probably more representative of all the targets in the volume than in this case down here with the large spectral width. Some biases can occur when measuring radial velocities that are seen when detecting the spectral width. Remember, the radial velocity reported is the average of all radial velocities of targets in a volume. This top example shows a Doppler spectrum that saddles the Nyquist velocity, or plus or minus V max. In this case, the radar sees targets that are moving away from the radar, so positive radial velocities, but because some targets are moving away faster than the Nyquist velocity, the radar interprets the volume as containing some targets that are actually moving quickly toward the radar, and that's the problem with the velocity folding if it's not unfolded. Thus, while the true mean radial velocity of this distribution is near the Nyquist interval, the reported radial velocity is skewed too low because it's containing all these uh, negative radial velocities that the radar is interpreting out of these actually strong positive velocities. The bottom example shows how ground clutter, which has zero radial velocity because it's not moving, can also contaminate a radial velocity estimate if actual hydrometeors, such as those represented by this part of the curve, are also present in the same contributing volume. The actual hydrometeors would have a mean radial velocity along the peak of this curve, but the zeros from the ground clutter would bias it too low. So these are just some examples of how the spectral width 
uh, and being able to view what the Doppler spectrum looks like uh, can help with resolving some biases that might occur in the radial velocities. It also provides a word of caution for interpreting radial velocities in these two types of situations.